Okay, so today let us see if we can make more sense out of uh, these uh, Matsubara Green's functions. So remember, I told you that uh, I have I still have to fulfill my promise of uh, making sense of uh, this original definition, uh, namely this. That uh, so I haven't uh, made sense out of uh, claims such as this, and I have to explain what that means physically but in some sense uh, well you can roughly convince yourself that this makes uh, sense in the following way. See after all uh, first of all it is obvious that this corresponds to uh, a hole propagator that means you are first creating a hole because you are removing an electron at position or whatever that particle is. Provisionally I am going to assume they are electrons because that is typically the type of uh, particles that we commonly encounter in solid state physics that is electrons uh, those are the ones that participate in electronic properties basically that is why it is called electronic properties because it is determined by the, how the electrons behave in the solid. So, in any event uh, so the basically it is the electron that is being annihilated here at position R and T. So, in other words you are creating a hole first and then you are uh, seeing how that uh, whole uh, wrecks havoc in the system by running around here and there and then eventually you remove the hole by or you fill the hole by inserting an electron at some other position r dash and at some other time t dash. So, the point is that um, uh, remember that uh, in the old way of when I started off discussing the whole propagator. I simply computed the overlap between the initial and final states. But now because the system is not isolated, it is in contact with surroundings, I have to take into account the fact that not all states, uh, are, mean, mean the system is not going to be in a well defined eigenstate of the Hamiltonian to begin with anyway. So, it is basically going to be in a superposition of all the eigenstates uh, with some uh, each state comes with a Boltzmann weight. And uh, if I also allow for the possibility of uh, particles uh, being exchanged with the surroundings then I also have this chemical potential. So, this is the grand canonical. So, so, instead of the Boltzmann weight I have this uh, grand canonical version of the Boltzmann weight. So, I end up uh, tracing the, uh, so in other words rather than calculating the expectation value of uh, C dagger C, I end up uh, first multiplying it by that Boltzmann weight uh, or the grand canonical version of the Boltzmann weight which is e raised to minus beta h h naught minus mu n and then I divide by the normalization which is the basically the trace of e raised to minus beta h naught minus mu n. So, that makes some sense does not it. So, basically we have uh, it, uh, it makes sense because uh, it certainly uh, represents uh, a whole propagator, but it also uh, conforms to the fact that you are averaging over uh, a whole bunch of states of the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian uh, each uh, associated with an appropriate weight which signifies uh, how strongly uh, the system is coupling to its environment. Okay, so, uh, so if you are satisfied with uh, that intuitive explanation, in fact uh, one should not underestimate the value of intuitive explanations because uh, a lot of physics uh, I mean a lot of formalism can be anticipated and in fact uh, a lot of uh, unnecessary detailed calculations can be shortened or sidestepped through use of physical intuition. So, one should not underestimate the role of physical intuition in uh, simplifying calculations in physics. In any event uh, bottom line is that uh, this is what it is. But now you see what I am going to do is that I am going to uh, uh, try and convince you that if I decide to ignore 
the mutual interaction between particles, then clearly the momentum becomes a good quantum number and I am perfectly justified in uh, expanding the fields in plane waves. So, that means I am, I am perfectly justified in doing this. So, I am perfectly justified in writing C of r comma t uh, in uh, so in, in other words I am perfectly justified in writing um, the r dependence as a superposition of plane waves and this is the amplitude. But more interestingly because it is a free particles uh, because it is a free particle the time dependence of this operator is uh, simply given by the uh, time evolution with respect to the energy of a free particle. So, and what is the energy of the free particle? It is just uh, h bar squared k squared by 2 m because p squared by 2 m and h, uh, p is h bar k and k is your wave vector. So, it is as simple as that you see. So, for a free particle things are incredibly simple that spatial dependence uh, of course, will involve some over uh, plane waves, but then the time, time dependence uh, will be uh, determined by the space dependence because it is a plane wave and the dispersion relation is fixed because it is just p squared by 2 m. So, if uh, given that I am currently only interested in free particles, then I can uh, very safely go ahead and insert this here and it is adjoint here and then see what I get. And what I get uh, these intermediate steps are for uh, you to be convinced that uh, this grand canonical ensemble in fact leads to the same formulas if you uh, you know sum over all the number of particles and so on you end up with a Fermi Dirac distribution and so forth. But uh, you see even otherwise you are going to be convinced because uh, what is going to happen is that you see if I take C dagger C I will just end up getting uh, so and I am uh, taking the trace yeah in fact that is exactly what I have done here. So, when you take trace this uh, this becomes a Kronecker delta. So, basically you will have to uh, do this and take trace. So, you have to first insert that here and then you have to take trace over uh, all the particles and uh, for taking trace you have to choose a basis in which uh, the it is uh, the number of particles uh, is basically diagonal in the number of uh, it is a particle number basis. So, I mean these are not unnecessary intermediate steps they are actually uh, very crucial intermediate steps, but that they, they are somewhat annoying and tedious, but uh, the end result is quite uh, expected and uh, kind of is very tempting to simply write this result, uh, but uh, you should keep in mind that it is strictly speaking it has to be derived this way by going all, all the way from here to here. But, uh, but having obtained this result it is uh, it is kind of believable it is so believable that it is tempting to ignore the derivation. So, basically what this says is that the whole Green's function is simply related to your uh, average of your uh, particle number that means the the average number of particles with momentum k. So, that is all it says that basically it is the Fourier transform of uh, the average number of particles in momentum state k. So, so that is the physical meaning of uh, the whole Green's function in momentum space. So, now I see um, uh, it is general enough to accommodate both fermions and bosons if you select sigma is minus 1 you get fermions if you select sigma equals 1 you are describing bosons. But keep in mind that we are still working in the grand canonical ensemble so there is the chemical potential you have to keep dragging along all over the place. But as I told you repeatedly you see in statmec if your system sizes are large. So, you can still study a canonical ensemble which is more typical by just relating the uh, chemical potential to the average number of particles. So, you just calculate the average number of total particles and then you can relate the chemical potential to the 
average density of particles in your system. So you might think that uh, you know how does that correspond to canonical ensemble because in canonical ensemble the uh, there is no such thing as average number of particles. The number of particles is strictly fixed but the claim is that you know when system sizes are large it is also fixed even in the grand canonical ensemble because uh, even though in principle uh, the number of particles in the grand canonical uh, ensemble can fluctuate but those the sizes of that fluctuations are extremely tiny compared to the average number of particles. So, so in fact even in the grand canonical ensemble it is safe to say that the number of particles is fixed in the thermodynamic limit. So, that is the reason why the grand canonical ensemble becomes equivalent to the canonical ensemble in the thermodynamic limit. So, similarly you can ask yourself what would happen if you had a, an electron Green's function. That means you decided to first create an electron and then propagate it and then you destroy it. So, clearly you get a different function which corresponds to the number density of holes. So, this is the number, this is the particle number density. Well, in some sense it is uh, yeah, uh, is the number of density of the actual electron, this is the number of density of whatever remains. So, if sigma is minus 1 is just 1 minus n n k. So, it is the difference between this is the leftover thing. So, um, so the point is that if you add these two you, you are bound to get uh, uh, Dirac delta functions means you, you will uh, rather you will get you at, at t equal to t dash you are going to get a Dirac delta function ok. So, that is to be expected because that is going to correspond to either the uh, average of the commutator or the anti commutator. So, basically if you would have C dagger R dash T and then uh, you decide to add uh, C dagger R dash T C uh, R T basically this will correspond to uh, you know the particle Green's function and this is the whole Green's function so in some sense. Uh, so, um, if you add these two it is just the anti commutator of C and C dagger which is clearly Dirac delta because it, the times are equal at equal times ok. So, uh, so now let us get to something uh, little bit more interesting and that is uh, I am going to point out that uh, I am going to show you that uh, there is a nice uh, connection between G greater and G less. And that connection is uh, in fact more general than what I have displayed here. So, I have actually verified this for uh, for you know the Green's function of free fermions and free bosons. But notice that uh, it is free bosons because you see the dispersion is h bar squared k squared by 2 m. But uh, it does not have to so this this so called k m s boundary condition that I am now going to derive is more general it is applicable uh, always ok. So, the point is that if you take uh, uh, one of the times and uh, decide to formally set it to minus i beta h bar. So, you might be wondering oh, what right do I have to do that, but uh, just uh, you know just imagine that you forcibly set t to minus i beta h bar and just see what sort of algebraic expressions you get. So, what, what you get is basically this expression becomes this expression, so this one becomes this. Now, uh, you uh, exploit this identity because after all what is n sigma? n sigma is this because of the, uh, this is n sigma you can easily verify that this is valid. So, because of this you can go ahead and insert uh, this instead of this ok. So, when you do that uh, lo and behold this becomes the uh, basically the whole Green's function because you started off with the particle Green's function and then you set one of the times to some. Uh, very funny imaginary value of the time and uh, by selecting the proper imaginary value of the time you have succeeded in converting what is basically an electron Green's function into a whole Green's function. But then that is uh, back at time t equal to 0, but then uh, there will be some pre factors there. So, that pre factors uh, will have uh, different signs depending whether you are dealing with fermions or bosons. 
So, if you are dealing with sigma equals minus 1, you are dealing with fermions and if it is plus 1 your bosons. So, the uh, bottom line is that this is called a Kubo Martin Schwinger boundary condition. This is very important uh, uh, and in fact, we will be using this uh, repeatedly in our discussions of uh, Matsubara Green's function. So, now that I have convinced you, uh, okay, I have not really convinced you that I have just derived you, uh, I have just derived this uh, KMS boundary condition uh, for the case of free particles but I have not strictly convinced you that it is valid always. So, I told you that there are many things like this which I would not be able to explain, uh, you know I cannot explain everything in a lecture. So, some of these interesting questions I will have to uh, either work it out in a special tutorial or I have to allow you to work it out in, a, uh, in an actual exercise or an assignment. Okay. So, that we will decide later on, but now let us uh, provisionally accept uh, that this is valid uh, not only for free particles, but it is also valid in general. So, if it is valid in general, then you see uh, for a system that is in equilibrium, clearly uh, the most general form of uh, the, okay, now I, I have uh, I have switched gears and uh, I am I'm speaking of uh, time ordered Green's function. I think uh, somewhere down the road or even earlier I, I introduced the time ordering. Yeah, so this time ordering, remember I, I actually started off this way. I started off with time ordering and the time ordering is in this imaginary, um, so when the times are actually imaginary. So, I am going to continue that way. So, if the system is in equilibrium, it is perfectly legitimate to uh, think of the times as being on the imaginary axis and then once you decide, um, once you commit to a certain uh, type of Green's function, whether it is particle or whole Green's function by selecting the order in which the T's and T dash occur, having done that after committing to a particle or a whole Green's function. Then of course, you can go ahead and analytically continue the times to a real times if you wish. But when you are dealing with this formal time ordering, uh, you are forced to uh, imagine the times to be on the complex plane. That means, you are forced to imagine that the times are purely imaginary. So, now uh, you see uh, given that, uh, so the reason why I have written it like this is because you see when uh, t is minus i beta h bar it is clearly um, minus i beta h bar is the, the largest possible time because all the times lie in this interval and this is increasing, in, this is the direction of increasing times. So, if t is uh, minus i beta h, g greater is basically same as g because after all uh, what is g greater? g greater is, uh, is basically the particle Green's function that means the annihilation to should be the to the left of creation. So, you have to first create and then annihilate. So, so that means that uh, see the time ordering is automatically the same as particle Green function for this particular time. So, conversely if you are dealing with a t equals 0 that is the smallest possible time. So, then uh, the uh, time order Green's function is automatically the whole Green's function because uh, see the time ordering now forces the uh, greater time to come to the left and the greater time is the one that uh, creates rather than annihilates. So, then the creation comes to the left of the annihilation. So, you are first annihilating and then creating that means it is a whole Green's function. So, that is why this makes perfect sense. Okay. So, this, this relation was uh, relating the uh, particle or electron uh, uh, particle Green's function to the whole Green's function, but this relates the time ordered Green's function to itself. Okay. So, that is the difference. So, uh, you see if this is the case, then uh, we know that basically in equilibrium, the system is translationally invariant in both space and time. So, what that means is uh, if you look at uh, uh, say if you look at the Green's function at point r and r dash that means you have either created or annihilated at r and you have annihilated or created at r dash. In that case if I shift uh, 
my coordinate system to some other location. So I just shift the origin of my coordinates without uh, rotating or anything. You just shift it parallel to itself to some other location. So then uh, that R will uh, go to R, R plus R0 and R dash will also go to R dash plus R0 because I have shifted by a fixed amount. So then you see uh, clearly we do not expect uh, the Green's function to depend on R0 because the system is translationally invariant. So it should only depend upon uh, where R dash is relative to R. That means if I sit at R, it only matters where R dash is uh, seen while sitting at R. So it does not matter where the origin is, that is pretty arbitrary. So, so therefore, the Green's function should clearly depend on the difference between R and R dash. So, similarly with times as well. So, it should only matter what the duration that has elapsed between T and T dash. See that those that is the duration between which you do the creation and the annihilation. So, it does not matter when you start or end. Basically, the system is in equilibrium, so it should not matter. So, if that is the case, then clearly when I Fourier transform, uh, I will of course uh, as usual go with the plane waves because the system is translationally invariant, but uh, then I can uh, introduce a certain frequency. So, you see normally when you do Fourier transform because the times are all continuous uh, quantities. So, I should be doing a Fourier transform rather than a Fourier series because uh, Normally, if you do not know the nature of the time dependence, the most general thing to do is would be a Fourier transform. But now, we know that there is a, a sense in which the Green's function is uh, has a flavor of being periodic because of this KMS boundary condition. So, the KMS boundary condition uh, allows me to kind of relate these Green's function to something that is genuinely periodic. So, if, if you have a Green's function that is in fact genuinely periodic, then uh, we all know that such a Green's function can be written as a Fourier series instead of a Fourier transform. So, that is pretty much what this is. So, it is a series, it is a series in uh, discrete frequencies. So, the frequencies now are no longer continuous, they become discrete. And now the question is now what what we have to do is we have to find out what those discrete frequencies are. So uh, in order to find that we of course insert uh, this relation into this uh, supposed uh, series expansion. So when you do that uh, you are forced to conclude that uh, the uh, frequencies have to obey this sort of relation. So that means um, this complex number of unit modulus should uh, have uh, this relation that is either plus or minus 1. So, that means that basically the, the uh, argument of this uh, exponent uh, should either be uh, an odd multiple of pi if sigma is minus 1 or an even multiple of pi if sigma is plus 1. So, in other words Z n itself is uh, an odd multiple of pi divided by beta h bar for fermions and uh, it is an even multiple of pi divided by beta h bar for bosons. So, these are called bosonic and uh, so this is called the fermionic Matsubara frequency and, uh, and this is called the bosonic Matsubara frequency. So, similarly your Dirac deltas also uh, have to obey this uh, bosonic, fermionic, periodic boundary conditions in imaginary time, okay, because every function basically has to obey periodic boundary condition of this sort in imaginary time, because that is how it is, okay. So, so now you can go ahead and convince yourself that the this G that I defined uh, using this grand canonical uh, statistical averaging of my uh, you know particle and whole Green's functions. That means by uh, uh, rather uh, this particle whole operators C C dagger or C dagger C 
I averaged them out uh, using grand canonical statistical averaging by inserting this weights. So, see that kind of a physical definition will certainly give some quantity, uh, but the big question is does, does it deserve to be called a Green's function or does it deserve to be called Green's function uh, because uh, the word Green's function is associated with the mathematician Green, I, I forget the rest of the details why I should probably look it up. But bottom line is uh, Mr. Green was a mathematician and he showed that uh, his Green's function, uh, uh, he had no inkling or understanding of many body theory, but he knew that uh, his Green function always obeys this equation. So, so the question is that unless we can demonstrate that this quantum statistical definition of uh, our uh, so called Green's function which is obtained by quantum statistically averaging particle hole or hole particle uh, creation operators also obeys the same equation that Mr. Green invented, then only we have a right to call that Green's function. So, what I have done in these uh, lines is uh, to demonstrate precisely that. So, I have been able to show that uh, First of all, uh, this particle and whole Green's function trivially obey this, but then uh, remember that uh, because uh, the time order Green's function are related to the particle and whole Green's function in this way, because you see if uh, you are talking about the particle Green's function t is greater than t dash, uh, oh sorry I made a mess, it is t dash greater than t. Okay. Uh, one of them is t greater than t dash, the other is t dash greater than t. So, that means if t is greater than t dash, uh, right. So, uh, that means your this is same as this. That means if t is greater than t dash, you are supposed to put whatever is greater on the left of whatever is smaller. So, so that means uh, in effect what you are doing is you are first creating a particle and then annihilating it. So, C gr G greater is basically the particle Green's function. Conversely, if uh, you decide to uh, make T less than T dash, then uh, you are supposed to put the thing which is uh, smaller which is this one to the right. So, the greater should always to be, be to the left, so it will become like this so, and it will pick up a sign depending upon whether it is boson or fermion because we know when you interchange you are supposed to pick up a sign if it is a fermion, a minus sign. If it is boson you pick up a plus sign which is same as not picking up a sign. So, bottom line is that if T is less than T dash you are supposed to first annihilate and then create, so it is a whole Green's function. So, basically this is particle, particle and this is whole. So, your time ordering is basically some linear combination meaning it is either one or the other depending upon which one is greater. Okay. So, but then uh, see if you go ahead and uh, formally try to see what equation, uh, what uh, evolution equation this G0 obeys then you immediately you will see that uh, it obeys this equation because there will be a del delta function in time because you will be differentiating the step function which gives you a delta function, but then the del delta functions after differentiation that you get will force this to become t t dash and it will force to add these two, but then adding these two with an appropriate sign will uh, well actually they will subtract rather than add but uh, it will in end up uh, becoming this Dirac delta here. Okay. So, bottom line is that uh, this quantum statistical definition of the Green's function while not initially obvious that it deserves to be called Green's function uh, with some effort you can show that in fact it does deserve to be called a Green's function because it obeys this equation. Okay. So, then uh, you can go ahead and uh, convince yourself that uh, this uh, this coefficient 
uh, you see this this is the Fourier coefficient of this g0 the time order Green's function uh, therefore has this very simple interpretation okay. So, it basically gives you it is the reciprocal of a function uh, or it basically it is a uh, it is an algebraic function uh, which has poles. So, that means basically it uh, so this function has poles whenever uh, i h bar becomes e k minus mu. So, so you, you see there are these simple poles. So, in that sense uh, this Green's function is uh, extremely simple and algebraic in its nature. But you see uh, this is only for uh, free particles because after all I have assumed that uh, e k epsilon k is h bar squared k squared by 2 m. So, you see k is anyway always a good idea to introduce even when the system is not consisting of free particles. So, long as the system is translationally invariant k is anyway a good quantum number. But then uh, you see even though k is a good quantum number even when there are interactions in the system so long as the system is translationally invariant epsilon k is not a good idea because epsilon k by definition is h bar squared k squared by 2 m, but that is only kinetic energy. But then when uh, particles interact with each other you also have potential energy. So, you cannot really do this. So, the way to introduce that uh, and then they see that the potential is anyway very dynamical because it is mutual interaction between particles. So, the way you introduce that is through what is called a self energy rather than in, is writing epsilon k you postulate that there ought to be something else and after all what is that something else it, it cannot I mean it cannot be anything but a function of k and z there is nothing else there. So, the most general situation is when you are able to write down some, some function of k and z in. So, it is customary to write it uh, as this. Okay. So, later on we will discuss uh, some implications of these uh, ideas you know what this means and how to go about calculating sigma you see that is one of the central questions in many body theory how to calculate the self energy of a system of interacting particles. So, it is by no means an easy task it is very difficult and uh, there are many uh, methods that people use. Uh, there is something called the loop expansion. So, you have this single loop, double loop and so on. So, we will try to touch upon those issues. We will not be doing full justice to those ideas because as I said this course is mostly about informing you about the topics that are worth learning. It is not to fully teach you those topics. It just tells you that these are the things that you should go ahead and learn. Okay, so, I am going to stop here in the next class I will start from here I will tell you what are the consequences of choosing either this or this you know there are some physical you know ramifications and uh, implications of uh, choosing this as your Green's function. We have not really chosen it we have derived it, but then this itself has some its own intrinsic physical meaning which we can extract through its real and imaginary parts ok. So, and especially this the imaginary part of this quantity has an immensely important physical meaning which I am going to discuss in the next class. So, I am going to stop here uh, let us meet in the next class thank you. Mm -hmm.